Hi guys, this is Dr. Amina Ali here. Thank you so very much for joining us today. We are going to have a great, great time today. Um, we are going to be speaking about stair steps to mental health. And this is going to be a joint venture that is going to both ascribe and describe different ways that we can get to the solutions. You know, my daughter, the other day, she called me on the phone and she was crying and I thought it was because life as a mother was kind of hard, but I, I see that she was really distraught about how people vacillate in the world of mental health. Um, she was saying she was in a group and all they were doing is literally passing the, the, the torch of trauma around and no one was offering real time solutions. So today, um, with her guidance and, and her desire, I'm going to offer a few tips that helps in all mental health development. And what do I mean by that? I want everyone to get to a solution in what they're dealing with. So this is not going to be for any specific diagnosis, dual diagnosis, treatment plan, or anything. This is going to be on the advantageousness of getting yourself to a discovery of solution. And this is going to also open you up to different ways to think about what you're going through so that you understand what it is that you're dealing with, and then better ways that you can challenge yourself to get to the solutions you need. So we're going to talk about it for a few minutes, um, maybe 30, 45 minutes, but we're going to talk about it in its entirety in four parts. And the four parts are going to be designed to bridge you into a higher level of understanding and then a secureness within you to challenge yourself to find the solutions you seek. So if we are ready, we're going to talk about part one. And part one is called the language of dignity. Now, what is dignity? So many people, you know, throw dignity around with the same admiration as they do the word respect. So let's define the two so we understand how we're going to use it today. Um, dignity is the right to be valued ethically and treated the same. The right to be valued ethically and to be treated the same. This means if you have a pulse, if you have breath, if you have an, a pumping heart, you have the right to dignity. This means that someone is to treat you ethically. This is one of the stance that we take in medicine that we say first do no harm. So no matter what we do, we're not going to offend them. We're not going to disrespect them. We're not going to harm them in any other way than what they came. If you came in with a migraine and your head is pounding, I don't need to be yelling at the top of my lungs. So we're going to learn that the dignity in that is to understand that the people coming to us are seeking solutions from us. So we're going to garner them with that dignity of knowing that even if we don't have the solutions, we're going to get them to the person that does. I may not be the smartest person in the room, but I know someone in the room is smarter than me. So we're going to get them to that person and the dignity of knowing that this is the follow through process. OK, so dignity, the right to be valued and ethically treated the same. Um, all right. What is respect then? Because, you know, you hear people all the time, you know, especially as women. Oh, she's going to give me my respect. You may not like me, but you're going to respect me. And I need this respect. And I respect, respect, respect. I don't know if Aretha made the song because she kept hearing the word all the time or if it was just something she needed to talk about because she didn't know how to spell it. You know, I don't know. But <laughs> I'm just joking, making light of things. But respect is a deep admiration for someone or something because of their qualities, talents, or achievements. I'll repeat that again. A deep admiration for someone or something. You could respect good health. You could respect the fact that I have a lot of money or that you're getting a lot of money. But it's a deep admiration for someone or something because of their abilities, qualities, talents, or achievements. I forgot abilities. Abilities, qualities, talents, or achievements. Okay, and this goes for things. This is the tangible touch things. And I like to say if you can put your hands on it, then that's how you have respect. But if you have to think about it to do it mentally, that's dignity. So respect is more of a tangible thing. This is the thing where you can reach out and touch Oprah. 
or you can call Gail King, or you can email um, Michelle Obama. These are tangible things. You respect them because of their achievements or, or because of their qualities, or these are things that you come into understanding of. This is something outside of you. So respect comes outside of the person and dignity is the person. It is the, the fact that they exist. I have three daughters and my daughters are always, always talking about, well, she don't respect me and mommy, how come she don't respect my toys and my this and my that? And it's not a respect. It's not a respect. It's maybe because she wanted to play with the toy and you weren't really playing with it, but you just had it next to you and now all of a sudden because she got it, now you want it. You know, that's, that's a you thing, but that's a whole nother show. But that's a you thing. And that's the thing that comes with you not understanding the concept of sharing. But in respect, it has nothing to do with that piece. That piece of you wanting something that someone else has or you desiring something has nothing to do with disrespect. It has to do with spatialness and the fact that something is yours and you didn't want to share it at that time. So we have to differentiate dignity with respect. And we also have to know the difference when it's used. People are to be dignified. Respect is to be earned. Earned through, uh, we said, abilities, qualities, talents, and achievements. So this is where we have to come away with that piece. And, 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 I, and I'm expanding on that a lot because it's going to make sense for the rest of the three parts. Okay. Um, now, what is the indignity? There's two types of dignity. The feeling of dignity and inherent dignity. Inherent. I-N-H-E-R-E-N-T, inherent dignity, and the feeling of dignity. Okay, so let's go with feeling first. That's something easy. When you feel dignified, you got all that feel good where you, you're feeling so good, you're almost drawn to tears. And that's the feeling of dignity. When my, all, my, my girls are together and my grandchildren are together and we're all playing and we cracking jokes and, and the adult side of us is getting together and remembering the old times. And then the kids are looking at each other like we crazy. And it's just, <laughs> but you know, you, you, you get to that moment when we're all laughing and joking and they're playing with each other and you sit back and you're just like, wow, like they're all here because of me. Like it's, it's almost a, a patting on the back that you got everybody to this point where we're all in one room together playing happy, healthy. And for five minutes, we don't have any worries in the world. That's a feeling of dignity. Now, some people say that's pride, that's a feel good, a warmth, but that's the, in, that's the feeling part of dignity. That is the part that lets you know that this is good and this is something that may be done because of you or brought together because of you or finally, after all life has happened, all my girls are in one room together with their, with their children and we are happy. So that's a feel good part of dignity. Now, again, no disrespect for the fact that, you know, even though your children are not together, that you still can't feel that you can get off the phone with one of your children and just want to be going to tears because you're just like, I love that girl. And you're just so happy. So that's a dignity of feeling. Now, inherit is your right. And I'm going to say that um, inherit is your right. So feelings would be earned. Inherent is your right. So just like dignity is because you exist and respect is because of what you've done. Feelings is something you've done. You've earned that. And inherent is your right. So you have an inherent right to dignity. So that means even though my daughters at times, they just like, oh, mommy is just so quacky and she's just, oh, just leave her alone. And they don't talk to me for 24, 48 hours, you know, and they just like, I'm just not even going to call. I'm not going to text her. I'm, I'm just going to block her on Instagram. I just, she just made me so mad. I still have a right to dignity. I still have a right for you to treat me in a certain way. And I have a right as your mother for you to give me that dignity. Now, you may not respect what I say. And because I ain't give you the money, you just don't like me right now. But <laughs> just know that there is a great way for you to hold on to that dignity. And that's because of that, um, that dignity that was earned, that dignity that was given to me as your mom. And I'm using these in small calibers, something that is soft and easy for you to understand, but applying them to mental health is the same thing. Regardless if you have mental health issues or not, you have the same inherent rights, the same inherent feelings, 
you have the right to the dignity and the respect of being a person with mental illness. So how does that play out? Okay, so you have mental illness, and let's, we're just going to use one specific um, um, piece of mental health or mental illness. And let's say bipolar, something that is easily accessible with everyone's understanding. Okay, we're not going into bipolar one versus two, just bipolar, okay? Now, because you are a person with bipolar tendencies, you have, or bipolar uh, deficiencies, you have an inherent right to dignity. That means because you have bipolar, I'm not going to say, oh, girl, shut up and take your medicine. You know, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen over here. And no one should treat you as though you're passe and something that needs to be treated with, you know, a couple of pills and a nap. This is something that allows that person to know, one, they're right. They have the right to be heard. They have the right to be listened to. And there is a difference. We're going to go into that in a minute. And they have a right to get solutions. So in that dignity of being bipolar, you have a right to be heard and listened to. When you hear someone, you're going to hear them with your ears. Some people say you listen with your ears, but for this case, we're going to say we're going to hear them with our ears. So I'm going to hear Mary, let's say, say, you know, Dr. Mina, um, I, I'm feeling really low today and my medicines are not really working anymore. I've been taking my medicines religiously and I think I'm just, you know, gaining some some kind of adaptation to it, and they're just not giving me the full effect, okay? So now I just listen to what she said. What I heard in that is I may need to titrate her up some medicine, or I may need to get her to a psychologist or a psychiatrist that can give her a different medicine. So listening and hearing are two different things. And, of course, it brought me to the third part, which is a solution, which she is inherently right to get. This is her inherent right to this dignity, okay? I respected her as a person to listen and hear. And then the dignity that I had as a professional to someone that is a patient is to get her to the solutions, okay? So these are things that you have to understand. If you don't have inherent rights of dignity and respect, you will continue to pass that trauma torch. Oh, girl, I, you know, I got bipolar. Girl, I got bipolar too. And I'm just going back and forth and back and forth. We're not getting to any solutions because we're not hearing each other. We're not listening. And all we want to do is have a pity party in front of 50 people just to feel like we belong to some group. You know, and that's really unfortunate. Although that has its place, it should not be the norm in counseling in, in mental health. Because someone could be listening and hearing two people go back and forth and pass the trauma torch never get to solutions and end up taking their life because they feel there are none. If we have a group of women in a, in a, in a, a conference that are talking about, Oh, I got bipolar. I got bipolar too. And I was molested. I was molested too. And that, and that. then they're going to think, Oh my God. Okay. So I got bipolar and I was molested. So are we going to find out how we deal with this? Are we going to learn the better way to, to, to have this or, or to deal with this in our living space? Or are we just going to keep announcing it and telling everybody? I mean, telling your story is powerful. But if you're not giving your story as a, a, a greater cause for a solution, then you're just repeating someone else's byline. And that's something that is really macabre. It's almost morbid. It's almost to the point where we're all going to live in this de detriment of, of trauma and relapse, and we're not going to ever get to solutions. Okay? So that's the language of dignity. That's part one. Part two, we're going to get into it. And I labeled it, how you feeling? You know, I can't say how you doing because that's a tagline that is copywritten. But I'm going to say, how you feeling? How you feeling and how you define your words of action. This is how you define your dignity. Now, it's one thing to say, hey, girl, how you doing? And you just really pass and just to say, hey. Most people don't answer that question. When you say, hey, how you doing? They don't answer that question. Because if they answer that question, they probably hear more than they want to know. And not everybody is, is equipped to hear you when you say, how you doing? So as my kids say, I used to hate it when they were younger and they used to say, what's up? To, what's up with what? Inflation, not the economy, definitely not my check. What do you mean, what's up? And I used to hear that and I used to get so bothered by it. What's up? But you know what I noticed? That was a safe word. And we're going to talk about speaking your words into action. When they say what's up, it normally invokes what's going on in your life. And it normally has a quasi-positive side of it. Because when you say, you say, hey, what's up? 
You want to know what you're doing right now. What's something I can get into? Are you doing something that that is going to change the world? Or are you just, you know, hanging out on the corner and you just, you know, drinking your beer? You know, what are you doing? And that's better than how are you? Because when you ask how are you, there's a responsibility in that question. Hear me. When you say how are you, you are asking them to explain what life has brought to them to this moment. You may not be equipped to answer that, to hear that question, because when you're given something, there's a responsibility to it. That's why I tell people, even though I'm in obstetrics and gynecology, well, was, I'm retired now. I always used to say, if I'm asking you how you are, it's because I really want to know. If I say, girl, how are you? Or how are you doing? What's been going on in your life? I'm asking because I'm waiting for you to answer that question. I'm waiting for you to give me an answer because clearly something that is physical in you, maybe your body language, your tone of voice, your temperament, is telling me something else is going on. And we got to get to the bottom of this because if we don't, we all going to be in here boohooing because we don't have any solutions. So when I say how you're feeling, we're going to get to the words. The words have power. Your powers of, of your words are mantras. When you say something over and over and over, it becomes a reality. And once that reality is set, that reality will become your reality. And that reality may, trans, may be transcendental to something negative that you may not have asked for. You know, when, when you say things like, oh, God, I'm not feeling well today. Guess what? You may not feel well all day. When you say things like, oh, my goodness, that's, that's, my stomach is upset. And you focus on, oh, why my stomach is upset. Guess what? Your stomach's going to stay upset until either you poop or you get whatever's in your stomach out. Why? Because the content of continually saying that my stomach is okay is putting energy into focus. So now I'm putting energy into my stomach not being okay and I'm focusing on it. I'm rubbing it. I'm leaning. I'm whining. Oh, my stomach. Oh, my God. Instead of getting up and taking something for it or getting up and doing something for it. Because sometimes something as simple as cramps can be alleviated by exercise. So get up and do some uh, uh, mountain climbers or or do some squats, or do something to relieve the pain. If it's something like indigestion, then go get a ginger ale and burp it up. Or if it may be some kind of lower digestion, then you may need to take some castor oil, which the kids hate when I even say the word, and take some castor oil and go ahead and poop that out. You know, But whatever it is, let's get to the solution of it. And this is where how you're feeling comes in, because there's three ways... That when someone says, hey, how you doing? What's up? Or what's going on? You can react positively. And it's a reply, a response, and a reaction. Okay? So how you feeling, you reply to it, you respond to it, or you react to it. So the three ways are very indicative of what the other person is going to receive. Or what the other person is going to take away from how you 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 gave you to them. So if, for example, my daughter, uh, my baby girl, she comes to me, Mommy, I can't do this. I, the first thing I'm going to say is take that word out your vocabulary when you're talking to me. You don't say can't anywhere near me. Because that's saying you gave up before you even heard my, my solution. And you're saying that because you're not challenging your abilities. How do you know you can't? How do you know? If you're asking me for a solution, you haven't even tried it yet. You're saying you can't. Those words have power. So when you ask how you're feeling and you're asking that, you're asking that in, in, the, in the way that you're either asking for a reply, a response, or a reaction. Okay? So what's a reply? Since we're saying we're going to do this on the reply, what is a reply? Um, definition says a verbal or written answer to something. So that's like replying to an email. That's why you notice at the bottom of the email it says reply. It doesn't say respond or react. It says reply. So you press that little button and it brings you to a, a text box and you start your text. Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm glad to receive your email. Thank you for your da-da-da-da-da. Finish the body. Press send. Okay? So a reply is you reply to an email. You answer a question. My daughters have tons of questions every day, and I think they had more questions when they were little than, ugh, and they just come to me, Mommy, what does this mean? Mommy, what does that mean? Mommy, what does this mean? Ma, 
Ma. And they keep doing that. And it's fun to me because as adults, they're coming to me like they did as kids. But what I see is that they're always learning. They're always evolving. They're always asking questions. And no question is a dumb question. Even if you ask me the same question on Monday and just do on Tuesday, it's still not a dumb question because maybe you didn't hear it on Tuesday. Remember we talked about listening and hearing. Maybe you didn't hear it on Tuesday or maybe you heard and you weren't listening. Okay. Anyway, so a reply is a verbal or written answer to something. Okay. So then what is a response, Amina? A response is a reply to a physical stimulus. Hmm. So I'm responding. So I may be responding. Hey, Dr. Mina, I have a question about such and such and such, and I need an answer about such and such and such. Well, my response may be, did you read the paragraph I gave you? Hmm. I just stimulated because I know if you just said you don't understand something and I told you to read something, maybe the answer would have been in what you read. So I'm going to come back with, did you read what I gave you? Well, no, I didn't get a chance to. So what you want me to do is just give you the answer. That's what you're asking me. So I can't give you the answer. You read that and then come back to me. That's a response. So this is specific. This is reply to a physical stimulus. The stimulus is you asked a question that you probably can get the answer yourself. And you asked it in a way that you want me to give you something to stimulate. You want me to stimulate you to give you the response. And I'm not going to do it. And I'm going to tell you I'm not going to do it because, you know, if you five feet from my mouth, you're going to hear me say you're going to do it yourself because I'm, I'm, I'm not going to enable you. But this is a physical stimulus. So if you get an email saying your uncle died, you may cry. It's not the email. It's what was in the email that you're responding to. You're responding to the fact that you just read your, your favorite uncle died. Or maybe you got an email that says you got into the fellowship. You're not responding to, you're not replying to the fellowship. You're responding because, yay, we got into the fellowship. This is something I've been working on for two years and I finally got into it. Yes. So this is a response. This is something that's physically that comes out of you, whether it's a tear, whether it's joy, whether you, you screenshotting it and sending it to everybody on Instagram. <laughs> that is your response to that. You are so happy. You are so elated. You're so sad. And that is the physical response of it. This is that point when I tell my kids, could you get out your feelings? Could you stop physically taking what I say verbally? Get out your feelings. Stop responding and reply. Let me know. Thank you, mom. I got it. I'll get back to you later. Okay. Stop responding. Ma, you crazy. Oh my God. Why would you say that? That's a response. So if reply is the verbal or written answer and a response is that reply that is dealing with a physical stimulus, what is a reaction? Because it sounds like everybody reacting over here. And it sounds like everybody's getting their, and getting their old panties in a bunch. But a response is an action performed or a feeling experienced in response to a situation or event. I'll, I'll read that again because I have to explain it. It's an action performed or a feeling experienced. In response to a situation or event. Okay? Here's the thing. I'm going to use my daughters. This is not true, but I'm going to use them as a, a an example because I have to explain this part. Okay, all three of us is in a group chat. We, we do have a group chat. But all three of us is in a group chat. And I come on there and I say, uh, Zakia, I'm going to send you um, a box full of clothes. And, um, and the clothes are going to be for the baby because it's winter time and I'm just going to send you some clothes. Okay. So she replies, thanks mom. I really appreciate that. Karima gets on there and she says, yay, that boy's finally getting some clothes. That's a response. Finally, that boy's getting some warm clothes. We ain't got to worry about this and do da, 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 da. But let's say Malika gets on there and she's like, well, what about Rafiq? So. She is responding to a situation or event. She's not, I mean, excuse me, she's reacting to a situation. She's feeling some kind of way. So this is part two to the feelings. When you react to something, you are reacting because the thing that you are responding to didn't go the way you want it or didn't, is not perceived in the way it was supposed to. So a reaction is your personal effort. In what you are responding to. So you could be 
feeling hatred, jealousy. You could be feeling like, oh, well, it's favoritism. That's how you are taking it. So a, a reaction is a you thing. It, you may even come across as saying, well, I don't even know why Zakia needs her. She got, she got money. And Zakia always going to the club and she always having this and she's always having that. Well, why is she can't use that money to get some clothes for the baby? Okay, you feeling that way. That's part two to in your feelings. Because you feeling that way doesn't mean that you need to give that to everybody else. And it definitely don't mean that it's valid. So your reaction is your reaction. So always put a your in front of that because that's personal. That's That's all about you. It has nothing to do with the response. The response could mean a reply. Thank you, mom. I really appreciate you doing that for her. And, you know, way to go. I'm glad the baby has some clothes. Or you can um, react. React is, mm, I don't know why she need all them clothes with all that money she got. Mommy, why are you sending her money? And you, you know, sending me a side message like, mm -mm, I don't think you should do that. And da, 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 da. That's your reaction. That has nothing to do with the truth. And it has nothing to do with that box that's in the mail already. So your reaction is your reaction. And you have to own that. Whether you feel it's justified and valid or you in your moment and you just was feeling that kind of way because you just in your moment in your feelings. That is your reaction. And sometimes your reaction can, can give a reply and response that may not be commendable or may not be in your favor. So understand that and understand how that works. You know, reactions work, work both ways. You hating on somebody may not give you the right response when you go to ask them for something later on. So just understand that and hear that while you listen to the difference between reply, response, and reaction. Okay, reply again, a verbal or written answer to something. This is replying to an email or answering a question. Response is replying to a physical stimulus. So you get that email. And your, your uncle died and you're crying. So that is a response. Now your reaction is what you do with that response. So you may not like that and you may say, good, I'm glad he's dead. You cry because he, he died, but now you're like, Shh, because he didn't, he didn't give me money for graduation, I'm glad he's dead. Or it could be just the opposite. It could be, he died, I'm sad, and now I need a minute to get myself together. So that is your reaction. So the reaction piece is an action performed or feeling experience in response to a situation or event. Remember, put your before that because reactions are always yours and you have to own them. Okay, that's part two. Part three of bias and prejudice. Hmm. Now, why are we talking about that when it comes to mental health? Bias and prejudice plays a huge, huge role in how people with mental health are listened to and heard. And the solutions, which remember, that those are the three. You're dealing with what it is that you're listening to, what you're hearing, and then the solution, which is always the trifecta. But when we're dealing with bias and prejudice, sometimes that filter just muffles all of that. And you don't even get what you think you're supposed to get because somebody done heard something totally different because they're filtering it through their bias and their prejudice and experiences of their life. So they get something totally different. I may hear my daughter hearing, mommy, I need this. I may need that. I may need this. Somebody from the outside listening to that same conversation is like, your daughter is really needy. <laughs> when really it's because she just moved and maybe she needed that because that's a new thing she needs in the new space she's in. But you didn't put it into a parameter. You just heard her. You heard her talk to her mother. And you made a judgment that she's needy. So let's get into bias and prejudice. That's part three. Um, the first one is the language of dignity. The second one is how you feeling. And the third one is a bias and prejudice. Okay, so let's define what um, prejudice is. And let's define what bias is. And we're going to do it in two words. This is your spoken behavior. Now, the, you remember we talked about how you're feeling? That's the power of your words. Well, this is your spoken behavior. This is your words in action. This is what you do with those words. And when you're in your feelings, what actually manifests. And why in mental health, you got to remember what bias and prejudice is when you're dealing with people. Okay? Because you could have a great one. Um, prejudice. Prejudging. You're coming into this with a, a misnomer of what it is that you are going to deal with and, and how you're dealing with it. If I get um, um, someone in a room with me 
and they start yapping about their problems immediately. I ain't even got their name out good. Your prejudice could mean, oh my God, this child is, she going to ask me for something at the end of it. Lord have mercy. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? I just got to get this girl to stop talking. That could be a prejudice. How do you know she just doesn't want to vent? How do you know you are the only person that she feels safe around to talk to? And you came into this thinking, oh my God, this child is just going to just talk my ear off because every time I talk to her, I, she just talks her talk because she feels comfortable enough to talk to you. And you're hearing it through a prejudice because you feel as though your judgment of her is greater than you listening to her. So your prejudice is you prejudge it. Um, um, the judgment is coming because of your filter, because of what it is that you are bringing to the table what you're bringing to the conversation and what your filter is not allowing you to, to unmask. Okay. So then what is bias? And when we talk about bias, are we talking about bias as it pertains to the bias that we, we see and we understand and we're dealing with on a day to day basis? Or are we talking about the bias that we are, we are in alienating ourselves from? Okay. So let's go to the definition. And, and I really want to, I mean, of course, prejudice is real easy, but bias as a definition has a different connotation to it. And bias is a prejudice. Hear that? A bias is a prejudice in favor of or against something. <laughs> There's those feelings again. Remember I talked about you all in your feelings at part two, were you reacting to something? Okay, so if prejudice is the prejudgment, bias is the prejudice that is for or against something. So you automatically put up your, your blinders to be for or against something. And that's normally because of history. So if, if I got to use my daughters, if Karima comes to me and she says, Mom, I, I'm, I'm needing you to do such and such and such and such, I'm going to be for it. My bias is going to be like, okay, we got to get to a solution, so let's get to a solution. My bias is automatically to be for her, even if it's something that she could do on her own. But if she's crying right now and she's doing, uh, whereas Malika, the stronger of the three, is probably going to be like, Ma, I want to tell you what I just did. I had a problem with such and such and such and such. And I went to such and such and such. And I did this and I got in this class or I did this program and da 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 da. And guess what? I'm about to buy me a house. So now I'm sitting here like, Okay, so why didn't you give that information to your sister? Because she just crying over rent money five minutes ago. Why you didn't do that? But see, her bias was that she was for doing better. She judged the rest of her sisters, and I'm saying this facetiously. It's, it's, don't hear this part. She judged her sisters in this uh, whiny, uh, just need to ask mommy for the solution. She was like, no, I'm not going to do that. So she was against that. But her integrity said, I'm going to be for bettering me, so I won't be one of those whiners. So a bias is a prejudice for or against something. Um, you see in society today, you see all of these Trump supporters, and they are very biased for Trump. Regardless of what federal felony they're about to attain, they are still biased for Trump. They feel as though that they have some solidarity with this man that they have never met. And they are, you know, all in for whatever it is that he says to do or don't do, or he going to join you and all this other stuff. So their bias is a prejudice against anybody that's not Trump or conservative Republican. And they are for doing what Trump says or what, whatever it's, I don't even know what they're saying. Cause it doesn't even make sense to me. And that's a whole nother show. But to know that is prejudice deals with four factors. It deals with who you are, it deals with your fear. It deals with the social environment that you're in. And it deals with your identity. Okay? And we're not talking about identity as in gender. We're talking about identity as in how you see yourself. Okay? So let's, let's dig into this for a minute. And this is just prejudice. Remember, this is under the column of prejudice. Prejudice deals with who you are. Who are you? Prejudices are different between male and female between the youth and older people, between black and white. So who are you? Where are your prejudices? Um, white folks may have a prejudice against black folks. Black folks may have a prejudice against white folks. If you're young, you may be angry and prejudiced. When you're old, you're just like, you know what, that's just white folks, or that's just black folks. And you realize that it's the people. So who are you? So in your prejudice, you may have that thing, because of who you are, that is greater than maybe somebody else. 
So it's who you are. Then it's your fears. When you're dealing with mental health, especially your prejudices come in because you fear the unknown. And when you fear the unknown, that is the greatest travesty to mental health. You don't know, so you fear it and you call it negative and you ostracize yourself or you do the pity party and you and misery loves company. It's either one of the two. It's either you push people away or you want to join them because you don't want to feel like you win this by yourself. But this is a fear mechanism. I don't know how to get to the solution, so I just want someone to join me. I don't know how to get to the answer, so I just want someone to make me feel good about being in this space. And you have this fear that you don't even know. It's innate fear. It's something causative in you that you that doesn't allow you to express yourself enough to get the help. And it's fear that's ongoing because, again, if you keep telling yourself this subconsciously, you will keep this fear going. You will give this spoken behavior validity. So in knowing that, you have fear. And knowing that fear is continual allows you to vacillate in your social environment, number three, and, and allow your social condition to remain the same. And I use this, and please don't hear this as I'm hating, and if you do this, that's your reaction. But when I say to people of color, if you keep talking, you ain't going to do nothing. If you keep talking, you ain't doing nothing. So the, the social condition or the social environment is of people of colors. We talk a lot. We talk, 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 talk. We don't have sessions like this where we get to solutions. We don't have um, uh, conferences where we talk about getting to the answers of the question. What about mental health in COVID? What about mental health being black in COVID? What about mental health being black during COVID and no solutions? These are questions and these are things we need to talk about, but we also need to be practical in getting these solutions. So we have tools in the toolbox, but if you're using a screwdriver to bang in a nail, we're doing it the wrong way. Okay, so you got to understand what we're doing. Social conditions will make people use that screwdriver and think they're right for banging that nail in there when there's a hammer laying right next to it. So our social conditions will allow us in our prejudices to maybe use our tools the wrong way. And when we use them the wrong way, especially mental health, again, there's ostr you ostracize someone, you uh, devalue someone, their dignity and respect is not adhered to, you don't listen or hear them, and so the solutions are not met. And the last one of prejudice is the identity. What do you identify as? Are you identify as someone that sits back and lets the world go by and you just watch it and you just talk about it on social media? Are you the type that... Uh, identifies with solutions and we're going to the solutions, hell or high water? Or are we somebody that's kind of in the middle where we sit back and we listen and we watch and we learn and then we stand up and we, we lend our leadership a great voice? These are behaviors. These are all behaviors that in, uh, indemnify what we do. It personifies who we are and allows our prejudices to be seen or maybe not seen. But if we're talking about prejudice, we have to go to the bias side. So we're going to talk about the bullet points under bias. And remember, as we said, bias is a for or against a prejudice. So if we know prejudice may not be good, we got to watch what our biases are. Our fragilities, the things that allows us to validate our biases because we feel like everybody else is doing it. Okay. So um, bias comes in three parts. Okay. So we have three bullet points for bias. One is the bandwagon of bias. This is just what I talked about. Birds of a feather. In my notes, it says birds of a feather. That means everybody's doing it, so I'm going to do it. Everybody got on skinny jeans, so I'm going to wear skinny jeans. Everybody got on uh, 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 Louis Vuitton shirt, so I'm going to get a Louis Vuitton shirt. Everybody got to look the same, but they want to say they different. No, all of y'all wearing skinny jeans. I want you to do this, and I, and I did this to another group. I want you to go outside, and I want you to walk down the street, and in your day, I want you to consciously be observant as to how many people wear loose-fitting pants throughout the day. I'll say that again. Make this just a, a, a medial research. How many people wear loose-fitting pants during the day? Just watch the women as you walk down the street. Watch the women when you get on the bus. Watch the women when you get on the train. How many women wear loose-fitting pants? And how many women wear skinny jeans, spandex, the, the, what's, the, what's the called? The, um... What's the pants, your workout pants, the sweats, the, all of that, that's form-fitting. I got to see all the dimples in your behind. Like, every day, you're walking down the street, young, old, 
uh, uh, Spanish, black, whatever. See how many women wear tight pants every day. And I'm telling you, you will be so surprised at how many women wear tight pants every day. Why? Because it's in vogue. It's in vogue. Everybody wants to wear tight pants because everybody thinks their body is just so phenomenal. And then they say, oh, no, because it's easy to slip on and slip off. So is a skirt. So is a pair of loose-fitting pants. Matter of fact, you don't have to lay on the bed to put them on, <laughs> skinny jean people. You have to understand that what you're doing, you are doing it on the bandwagon. Your bias is because everybody else is doing it. I'm going to be right with it, and I'm going to say that it's right. And because everybody's doing it, I'm, my bias is going to be that it is right. No, it's not because I have so many women that came into my clinic with yeast infections because of them tight pants that I said the cure is taking them pants off. Wear a skirt, air it out a little bit, something, you know. That's just the way I am. But anyway, next one, confirmation. You have a bias of confirmation. What is a bias of confirmation? It's called cognitive dissonance. Your bias of confirmation, cognitive dissonance, is you saying, I know the answer, and I know it's really right, but I'm going to do it this way anyway. I know it's right, but I'm going to do it this way anyway. I'll say that again. I know what's right, but I'm going to do this Anyway, and then when something happens, then you want someone to come and save you. <laughs> As a parent, that's one thing that just gets underneath our skin, and it's just that last nerve that you just want to pluck, and every child has gotten that, that last nerve at the last time, and I can't take no more, you know? And as a mom, that last nerve is that nerve that you just want to just strangle that little girl, and you just, I'll take the charge later on. Just come on. You knew better when you did it. I have a daughter, and I'm not going to say which one, but she dated a man that when he drove up to my house, I wanted to just flatten his tires. I just wanted to find a way to just hurt this man. So, and it wasn't the man. It really wasn't the man. It was the desire that my daughter saw in him that was really not healthy. And that told me something about her. And that's why after a while, I just stopped saying that. I stopped saying, please don't bring him to the house. Please don't bring him by. Please meet him at the corner somewhere and just have your girlfriend pick you up and drop him off at his house or something. Because I really didn't want to see him. And that's because I saw something in her that was very reactionary to him. She was missing her dad. And because she was missing her dad, she was seeing the, the traits of what he was giving her. Those behaviors, those words, those things. And she was using that as the filter to feel happiness. Okay? And that confirmation, she knew, she knew it wasn't healthy. She knew it wasn't healthy. She knew that the, she knew what, what it is that she was doing wasn't healthy. She knew it. And when she knew it, she still decided and desired to go that route or go with him. And in mental health, cognitive dissonance gives you valid, it gives you validity and it validates you in what it is that you're doing. But when we're talking about the confirmation of bias or bias is confirmation, we're looking at that cognitive dissonance as to how it fits me. How is uh, how am I looking at this thing? How am I looking at this mental illness? Am I looking at it through the lens of people that are telling me that bipolar is wrong? Am I looking at it through the lens of my mother supporting me and not really making me feel like bipolar is anything that I need to deal with? Or am I looking at it through the lens that I'm not even going to accept being bipolar. And I'm going to change what I know is wrong. I'm going to eliminate that cognitive dissonance. I'm going to eliminate that anger. I'm going to eliminate those things that are hindering me and hurting me so that I can get to that thing that allows me to get clear of this situation. I may feel depressed. That doesn't mean I'm claiming depression over my life. I'm going to speak life over me. And I'm going to say that I'm going to stop doing those depressive things. If you do self-esteemable things, you gain self-esteem. But if you do depressive things, guess what? You become depressed. Those are those spoken behaviors, spoken, words have power, behaviors, doing it over and over and over again, that allow your reality to take root. So when we talk about the bias of confirmation, it's that cognitive dissonance. I know better, but I'm going to do this anyway. And this is what you need to see in your mental health approach. And the last one in bias is the in-group mind. In-group, I-N-G-R-O-U-P, in-group mind. Now, it's different than the bandwagon because, <coughs> excuse me, the bandwagon is everybody doing it and we're going to do it, whether it's right or wrong, you following the crowd, da 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 But this one is more methodical. And I'm going to break this down for, for a, a minute or two. 
the in-group thing is your click. Now, a lot of people are like, Amina, I don't think I like where this is going because, you, you know, you're not, you going somewhere that, that's going to step on my toes. Yeah, because if you got a click, I'm going to step on your toes. Having a click means that you're going to ostracize everybody else to make you feel comfortable in the people you're around. That's what a click is. I ostracize everybody else to make me feel comfortable in the surroundings that I'm in. The bigger example of that is people in church. Not Christians, people in church. Hear what I say. People in church will save a seat for somebody just so they can sit in that second row. And they will, if somebody new coming into the church, people will walk right past them. Have you ever had that experience where you go into a new church trying to find a church home and you got people in there that's, that call themselves deacon and, uh, and a senior usher and the pastors, to, uh, whatever, because, you know, they got a whole lot of titles. But when you come into the church and they know you a new face, they'll walk right past you. They'll walk right past you. Won't say good morning. Won't say hi. Act like they were doing something else. Act like they didn't see you. That is that thing because you are not a part of that clique. Now, I've seen it happen to people. I've seen it in Christian Christianity. I've seen it in Islam. I've seen it in Judeo-Christian pieces. I've seen it in Judaism. I've even seen it in the Hebrew Israelites. People don't know you, and they automatically have an adverse reaction to you. Well, that in-group thing is the deadly part of the bias. Because that in-group thing makes you feel whatever you're feeling even worse. Because now there is no acceptance from people you're coming to to gain some kind of respect from. You're going into a religious entity or you're going into a new social club or maybe even even in my my sorority. You know, there's a bias there. There is an in-group bias there. And that in-group bias is if you ain't saying that call sign and you ain't putting up them colors, we don't really want to hear nothing from you. And one of the reasons why I don't participate too much in, in all of that is because, first of all, I'm grown. I'm out of college. That was what we did then. And then, two, I'm not going to judge you based on Greek letters, and I'm a black woman, and colors that I can find in any clothes any time of the day, okay? And I'm not going to ostracize you just for the sake of a group. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to welcome you as a black woman because you're a black woman. Or I'm going to welcome you as a, a, a person that is professional because you're professional. Or I'm going to welcome you as a human because you deserve that dignity. And we're going to vibrate in that sense. So that in-group bias very deadly and it even it has caused many suicides because people have been suicidal go to their church and the first thing they say oh girl pray on it okay well what do you think i was doing why you think i'm coming here because clearly praying ain't changing things in this sense because i'm still suicidal but i'm coming to you and the first thing you say is pray on it and that's because in your group <laughs> the first thing that comes out of the pastor's mouth is let's let's go to prayer and although that may work that may not be the thing that is needed in mental health. So in mental health, we have to understand that the solution is going to come, but it cannot come through in-group bias. So if you recognize it, you can come outside of that and then begin to talk to that person so they can be heard, they can be listened to, and they can get the solutions. And the last part of this for, for today is you have to understand that there is ad hoc intentions ad hoc which is a, you know i and of course okay well let me define that because most people they'll say ad hoc and they'll be like what does that mean ad hoc a d h o c ad hoc definition and that is when it is necessary or needed ad hoc created or done for a particular purpose so ad hoc and when we deal with intentions, it is intentions that you give because it's needed and deserved. It is needed and intended. It is needed for the person at the time. So you may not, for, for example, you may not have the solutions to the problem, but the ad hoc intentions is, I don't know the answer, but we're going to find it together. That is the best reply, response, and reaction to someone that comes to you for help. I don't have the solutions to this answer, but we're going to find it together. So that means the intention is to go through this with them, hold their hand so they don't feel by themselves. You're going to reply in a way that they know that they feel secure that you heard and listened to them. You're going to respond in a way that is empathetic. Remember, that's a feeling thing. That's a personal thing. And you're going to allow them to know that this is something we can do together. 
And then you're going to, what's the third one? You're going to react in a way. And that reaction is going to be you. Put your in front of it. So your reaction is going to be intentional. And it is going to be intentional because the intention is going to go for the service of someone with mental health. Now, does that make you a mental health counselor or make you a mental health life coach or any of those words? No, that just makes you an empathetic, dignified person with integrity. And that's what we're all striving for. So many people are, you know, they're demanding respect when they're not striving for dignity. And that dignity is that thing that sets you apart from any other human. That thing that makes people comfortable coming to you to talk to you because you show dignity. You show that humanitarian spirit. You have ad hoc intentions, that on the fly intentions to find out that solution. And when you're dealing with people with mental health, that may be the solution. Did you realize that 99% of the people that, that come down off that ledges because someone came to them with the, the ad hoc intentions to listen? In order for you to be heard, you have to talk. In order for you to talk, you can't be jumping off that ledge. And in order for you to, to, to not jump off that ledge, you have to feel like life is worthy. When someone is in that throes of right now moment, and I like to use that right now moment so we don't have to say the word suicide or suicide intention, that right now moment, we are dealing with this in a right now moment. My daughter calls me and she's crying. I'm stopping whatever I'm doing. Just like, you know, when you see that when my grandchildren, when they were younger, especially, well, I have young ones now, but they, I have one that's older. But my first one, when he was, when he was little itty bitty thing and I could hold him in my hand and oh my goodness, he's just so juicy. And he used to get that bottom lip, you know, that bottom lip cry where that bottom lip comes out and it's just the cutest. I was like, oh, I don't care what I need to do. I just need to get that lip to stop. That is an ad hoc intention. <laughs> I just need that lip to stop because if he keeps doing that, it's going to make me cry and I don't want to see me cry. Oh, and you just, whatever you need to do. Now that they grown, they can throw that lip out that they want to, but I'm going to give you some tools and you're going to do it yourself. That's an ad hoc intention. That ad hoc intention is I'll be here, but you're going to do this yourself. Why? Because you can't. And sometimes that is what that person needs when you're dealing with mental health. They need you to listen, to be heard, and they need you to offer solutions. If you can't offer solutions, what you going to say? I may not have the answer to that, but girlfriend, look, we're going to do this together. So in that is two points. We're going to have faith and trust. Simple. Ad hoc intentions is based on faith and trust. And we're not talking about faith as in the spiritual ooh, kumbaya. Um, we're not talking about all that. We're talking about faith as in, you know, we're going to get to this to solution to this. Okay. You know within your soul of souls, if something happens to one of my children, I know I'm going to have an answer. I don't even know what the problem is yet. Because you know with all you are and who you are inside of you, we're going to find a solution, we're going to pay for a solution, or we're going to have a legal aid for that solution in the next few minutes. Because there ain't a problem out here that my children have that I ain't going to solve it. That is what a mother says when she wakes up in the morning, when she goes to bed at night, and when she kisses them on the forehead because they're so peaceful when they're sleeping. That is an ad hoc intention that you give to your children from the womb. And all three of my girls, I gave it to them. I'm giving it to their children now. And I'm saying that as a tribal elder, I am going to give you all ad hoc intentions because I'm going to find a solution. And this is where you need to be in your empathy with people that come to you with mental health issues. That you need to have ad hoc intentions, even if it's to say we're going to find it together. So faith was the first one. Trust is the second one. You got to be trustworthy. Um, there are times when my children don't talk to me for a couple of days, but guess what? When they pick up their phone, who answers? Because they trust. I know I was in my feelings. Mind the first thing out their mouth. Mind, I know I was in my feelings. I know I'm angry and such and such. I know I was feeling some kind of way. I may have broken up with my boyfriend and I was in my feelings or whatever have you. And I treated you that way. I apologize. It's okay, baby. I knew something. I knew something was wrong because, um, you don't normally talk to me like that. And the fact that you did means that I just got to let you deal with that. That's your reaction. Remember your reaction. So your reaction is not my bailiwick. That is not something that I need to deal with. So trust is a firm belief in the reliability or the truth in something. Trust, firm belief in the reliability of truth or something consistently. You heard what I said. Firm belief in the reliability and truth of something consistently. 
I trust my children are going to come to me and talk to me about my grandchildren. I trust my grandchildren are going to come visit me. So hint, hint, children, I need to see my grandchildren. And I trust that I'm going to be able to love my grandchildren even more tomorrow than I did today. That is the firm belief in the reliability and truth of something consistently. So when you're dealing with people with mental health, that trust has to be there and that trust has to be known to the people you're talking to. And mental health solutions will always come if you have those four things. And because my time is up, I'm going to talk about them really quick. Language of dignity, dignity versus respect, inherit versus the feeling. Uh, the second part is how you feel it. And this is your words in action. This is how powerful your words are. And this is talking about the reply, the response, and the reaction. The reply is a verbal or written answer. Response is a reply to the physical stimulus. So you get the email, your uncle died, and you're sad. That's your, that's your response. And then the reaction is your reaction. So that's what you took from it. That's what you got from it. Whether it's hate or love, that's what you got from it. Okay, number three is a bias and prejudice. Remember, prejudice is of who you are, your fear factor, your social conditioning, and your identity. Your bias is three parts. Bandwagon, which is birds of a feather. Everybody's doing it, so I'm going to do it. Confirmation, cognitive dissonance. I know better, but I'm still going to do this. And then in-group bias, which is your click, because you, you feel validated because a few people just told you what you were doing was okay with them. And the last part, uh, part four is ad hoc intentions that deals with faith and trust. Faith is the knowing that you know, that you know, that you know that something is going to have a solution because you know that if you don't have the answer, we're going to find it together. And then trust is the firm belief and reliability of truth consistently. So when you trust something is because something has showed up and done what it is that they said they're going to do or did what they were supposed to do consistently. So I hope that helps you in your measure of dealing with your stair steps to mental health and mental health solutions. And no matter what it is, you have a garnering of effect that will allow you to understand that this too will be a solution garnering uh, uh, process if you utilize all of those things in your response, reply, and reaction. And if you're truly empathetic, you will be able to give someone something that is so precious. And that is your time and your time to listen to them, your time to be for them and your time to be in great care of what it is that they need. And that is the solutions that they deserve. So until next time, I want to thank you so very much for all that you have done, all that you are and all that you will be for somebody in need and make sure your mental health cares come with solutions. I am Dr. Amina Ali and until next time, be well and take care of each other.